This video is sponsored by bootcamp.com. Check it out for INBDE prep and use coupon code MENTALDENTAL for 10% off. Hey everyone, Dr. Ryan here and welcome back to Mental Dental. A lot of you have asked for more case type questions to help prepare for the INBDE, so here they are. And I hope to make many videos like this one with around five questions from all different topic areas all applied to the same patient case. So here we go. This is the patient box for this case set. So we have a female patient, 34 years old, and her chief complaint is that she hasn't been able to taste with the right side of her tongue for the last week. And of note, she had a right inferior alveolar nerve block at her previous dental appointment, no other significant findings. So go ahead, read through this question, and then we'll go over the answer together. So this question came with a diagram and it's showing the dorsal surface of the tongue. And so we have the tongue broken up into thirds split at the midline. So the anterior two thirds of the tongue, that's this portion here, is demarcated from the posterior third up here by the circumvallate papillae which form that V towards the back of the tongue. The anterior two thirds is innervated by two different nerves. That's the lingual branch of the trigeminal nerve for touch sensation and the corda tympani of the facial nerve for taste. Whereas the posterior one third is innervated by one nerve, that's the glossopharyngeal nerve, which takes care of both touch and taste. So that's how I tend to remind myself that the anterior two-thirds is innervated by two separate nerves, the posterior one-third is only innervated by one nerve. So that's a nice way to remind yourself of that fact. And of course there are different nerves for each side of the body, so for the patient's right side it's going to be innervated by the right lingual branch of the trigeminal nerve, the right corda tympani, and then on the left side, same thing. Those nerves will stop innervating at the midline. So an inferior alveolar nerve block will often get the lingual nerve of cranial nerve 5 or the trigeminal nerve as well. That is not uncommon. It's much more uncommon to affect taste though. Not impossible, but it is more uncommon. The corda tympani of the facial nerve, or cranial nerve 7, hitchhikes along the lingual nerve branch, and so it can be affected by the local anesthetic in rare cases, and this is called iatrogenic ajusia, or loss of taste. It would be nearly impossible, though, to anesthetize the glossopharyngeal nerve, which is way at the back of the throat, with an inferior alveolar nerve block. So since it's possible that the corda tympani was affected, that leaves us with the anterior two-thirds of the tongue that could possibly be what the patient is talking about. And of course, we have to go with the right side of the anterior two-thirds because that's where the block was, and that's also where she said the loss of taste was. So that leaves us with answer choice C, regions three and five. So for question number two, we go further in depth on the sensation that the patient has been feeling. So go ahead, read through this question, and then we'll go over it together. So let's piece apart these terms in the answer choices. Dysesthesia means abnormal sensation. That's dis for bad or difficult, and then esthesis for feeling or sensation, so a bad or difficult feeling or sensation. And it's usually this kind of painful, burning, or aching feeling. So not quite what she's talking about here. Paresthesia refers to a tingling or prickling sensation, that's para for irregular, and then again, esthesia, sensation, so an irregular sensation. And this is usually painless, and described as tingling, uh, maybe the skin crawling or itching. So that's a little bit more in line with what we're looking for, so we'll keep that in mind. And then anesthesia refers to a loss of feeling, including the feeling of pain. So an means not or without, 
and then again sensation so not sensation and sensitivity to all sensation especially as artificially induced by the administration of a gas or the injection of drugs like local anesthesia and then lastly we have analgesia which is relief from pain and once again without and then algene which means to feel pain so without pain and so for the pins and needles that's that kind of tingling crawling itching sensation that falls most in line with paresthesia or that irregular sensation all right so question number three this one is going to go more in depth on the inferior alveolar nerve and its anatomy. So go ahead and read through this question and then we'll go over it together. So this inferior alveolar nerve is perhaps one of the most important nerves that we need to be familiar with as dentists. And it branches from the mandibular nerve. Now the mandibular nerve or V3 has two main components. It has a posterior root, and that's the area that we're numbing with this block, and it also has an anterior root, which we don't numb with the block. So let's go over the posterior root first. This is going to include the auriculotemporal nerve, so the auriculotemporal nerve, and this one uh, supplies skin of the temporal region of the head. There's also the lingual branch, or the lingual nerve, and this supplies the lingual gingiva, the floor of the mouth, and the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, like we just talked about in the first question. And then we have the actual inferior alveolar nerve. And this enters the mandibular foramen to travel through the mandibular canal, and it supplies all the mandibular tooth pulps as well as the alveolar bone. Then we have the mylohyoid nerve, and this one branches off right before that IAN enters the foramen and provides motor branches to the mylohyoid and anterior belly of the digastric muscles. There's also the mental nerve, as I'm running out of space here, and the mental nerve branches off and exits the mental foramen below around the mandibular second premolar and supplies the anterior buccal gingiva, the lower lip, and the chin. And lastly, we have the incisive nerve. And the incisive nerve continues on after that mental nerve branches off to supply all the pulps anterior to the mental foramen. So all of these that I just listed here are going to be ideally numbed by a successful block. So if we just go through the answer choices, we can rule out mental nerve, we can rule out incisive nerve, and we can rule out lingual nerve, which are all part of that block. Now just for comprehensiveness sake, that anterior root I talked about, the part that doesn't get blocked, that's going to include motor branches to the muscles of mastication, so the temporalis, the masseter, and the lateral pterygoid muscle are all going to be innervated by this one and the long buccal nerve. So the long buccal nerve, it kind of drapes over the coronoid notch area to supply the cheek and buccal gingiva of the posterior mandible. And so that one is not going to get affected by a block and would typically require another separate injection. You can also see that in this diagram that IAN block is going to cover this whole green area so if we really wanted to numb this area here in yellow, it would require a separate injection to get that long buccal nerve. So the answer here is C. So a little bit more anatomy being asked in this question. Which opening of the skull base does the mandibular nerve pass through? So go ahead, pause the video, think through this question, and then we'll go over it together. So a foramen is an opening that allows vital structures to pass from one part of the body to another. In this case, we're talking about a foramen of the skull. Now, we already talked about the mandibular nerve passing through the mandibular foramen and the mandibular canal, but that would be a little bit too easy. And so we're going to ask further up towards the skull base, where is this nerve exiting? So if we go through these one at a time, I'm going to start down here. The foramen lacerum, 
transmits the greater petrosal nerve as well as the deep petrosal nerve, the two of those together called the vidia nerve. The foramen spinosum is going to transmit the middle meningeal artery. Foramen rotundum is going to do V2, which is the maxillary nerve, and foramen ovale V3, or the mandibular nerve, as well as the lesser petrosal nerve. And so foramen ovale is going to be our answer for this question. All right, and I have just one more left. So go ahead, pause the video, think through this question, and then we'll go over it together. So this one might be the trickiest question of the set because it's a clinical decision type question. Expect a lot of these on the exam, applying concepts usually from oral pathology, pharmacology, and or oral medicine. So just like in the clinic, take things step by step. We gather our information first, then we make a diagnosis, and then we select a treatment plan. So before jumping to the answers, you'd have to figure out the diagnosis. Now in this case, I was nice and I gave it to you. So the pain and swelling associated with this nerve is due to an iatrogenic nerve injury, probably from a poor block that mechanically damaged the nerve. So pain, swelling, and even trismus can be caused by this kind of nerve injury. So let's go through the answer choices. Monitor for two weeks. When you have pain and swelling involved, that's not something typically you can just sit back and observe. So we're gonna go ahead and rule out that answer choice. Refer to an oral and maxillofacial surgeon. This is a conservative option to refer and certainly not a bad choice if you don't know what's happening or you need the head and the hands of a specialist. So we're gonna save that one for now. Now let's look at the next two. We have NSAID in both answer choices. And this honestly makes a lot of sense. We wanna reduce the pain and the swelling, the inflammation. So we want a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Now how about the other drug? We have in this first one methylprednisolone, known as a medrol dose pack, which is a steroid that has been shown to be effective in helping reduce neuropathic pain associated with peripheral nerve damage. So that one also sounds pretty good. So I like this answer choice quite a bit. Amoxicillin is an antibiotic indicated for use in signs of systemic infection, which we don't have here. There's no giant cavity, there's no periapical radiolucency or massive fluctuant swelling. This kind of swelling is directly associated with the nerve injury, so we can rule this one out as well. Now ultimately, while B is a fine choice, C is the better choice because all of this will help the patient more readily deal with their pain and their swelling and ultimately help them heal from this iatrogenic injury. So the answer for this one is C. All right, so that's it for this video, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to this channel for much more on dentistry. If you'd like to support me, please check out my Patreon page. And thank you to all of my patrons here for their support. You can unlock access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exams. So go check that out, the link is in the description. Thanks again for watching everyone, I'll see you in the next video.